everyone, South by Southwest. I'm Cody Sanchez with Entourage Effect Capital, one of the largest private equity and venture capital firms in the cannabis space. And I'm thrilled to be here with the ArgView Group. We are hosting a few surprises for you today on this panel with some of the biggest names in cannabis, some of the industry activists that started it all, and certainly those who we think will be the future of this industry. And we're going to talk about why this green rush matters to each of you. In particular, we're going to talk about what's happened in 2021 and 2020. If you guys weren't living underneath the hole, you saw that there was an election that happened this last year. And in that election, there was a nation really divided, right? And one of the interesting parts about today is there was a saying in cannabis that one of the few areas that we unified around as a country ended up being this green plant. In fact, we like to say who won the election, that would be weed. And so we dive in to why this matters to each of you, to how cannabis will spread its roots across industry, and how do these titans of industry running some of the largest cannabis companies out there think it's going to play out for each of you. If you didn't know, there are some fun facts in the world today, in particular that due to the election, now one in every three Americans actually sits with access to cannabis, whether recreationally or medicinally. And you may not know that more than 60% of the populace is for legalization of cannabis. Or some fun facts such as the cannabis industry actually employs more people than the entire coal industry. So this little cottage group that used to be highly stigmatized and persecuted has really come onto the mainstream. Whether you're looking at all-time highs in cannabis stocks or whether you're looking at private companies IPOing for the first time or first time hitting profitability. So today, our hope is we answer your questions about this plant. We demystify it a little bit and you get it to open your aperture into the opportunities that will arise in this newly emerging industry. So with that, I want to actually ask these two gentlemen to introduce themselves and to try to not be humble while you do it because you have such impressive accomplishments. I want to start with you, David Abernathy. Tell us a little bit about you, ArcView Group, and how you consult with some of the biggest companies out there to figure out exactly what I'm talking about, how to break into this green new industry. Uh, thanks, Cody. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm David Abernathy. I'm a principal at uh, ArcView Management Consulting. I've been in the cannabis space for uh, about 12 years now uh, and with ArcView for going on eight, uh, managing uh, a lot of different uh, aspects of what ArcView has done over the years, including running our market research division that has published the industry leading uh, reports on uh, on the cannabis industry and trends and regulations and market projections uh, since about 2013. Um, for the past couple of years, we've been starting to get into consulting and really for the past year or so, we've uh, doubled down and uh, built initially a consulting division and now uh, an entire uh, entity devoted to management consulting. So we help clients across uh, industrial hemp, CBD, um, uh, as well as adult use and medical uh, cannabis. And we, we really try to take a holistic look at businesses and help them scale in the way they want to scale, mitigate risks um, that they might be facing uh, and start to, for, for companies outside of the cannabis space, start to incorporate things like CBD or industrial hemp into uh, their products or services in ways that uh, can, can increase welfare or decrease um, their carbon footprint, water usage, reliance on on uh, petroleum-based plastic. Super interesting, David. Thank you for sharing. I, I think you're exactly right. This is a very diverse plant. I think there's something like 10,000 use cases for the hemp and cannabis plant. So there are a myriad of things to consult on and a myriad of ways that people will attack this industry from people like us that go to allocate you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to the startups they're in to people like 
Constellation brands who want to make sure that their portfolio encompasses this plant as well. So that's great. Now, I want to switch over to you, Michael. And before I let you, you tell your story and share with everyone about uh, walking the halls of Congress and what you've done from a cannabis legislature uh, perspective, can you talk to me a little bit about the landscape legally and from a regulatory perspective today? So as many people probably know, cannabis had one of the biggest election uh, cycles this past round. We had numerous states that went fully recreational. We had more states that allowed for recreate, uh, that allowed for medicinal. We also had hundreds of bills go through Congress and definitely hundreds of bills go through the local legislatures that were in regards to cannabis. It can be a little daunting to follow all of the different legalese in this industry. So why don't you give us a little bit of a brief picture on where are we at from a regulatory standpoint with cannabis today in the U.S.? And why do you have a unique insight into that landscape? Well, thanks, Cody. And it's been about a year and a half since I saw you. You are keynote at one of our conferences in California, and COVID is keeping us from doing conferences. So I can't wait uh, to where we can do some more conferences and I can see you again. So appreciate the time and the questions. So I am uh, Michael Crea, Director of Government Relations for the National Cannabis Industry Association. We are a trade association for the cannabis industry. We are the longest uh, uh, lasting trade association. We've been around 10 years. We have uh, over a thousand plus member businesses. Uh, my job has been uh, lobbying for the cannabis industry at the federal level. I started in 2013. Previously, I'd worked on the Hill. I've been in politics for about 25 years. Um, but when I started in 2013, there still was not any legal sales. Uh, that happened in Colorado in January of 14 and then Washington State in July of 2014. And um, the world has changed. You know, there were many times where I would, you know, have politicians physically backing away as I was shaking hands with them because they were assured, what is this cannabis industry? What is this, a gotcha moment? There was always... Contagious. There was always the giggle factor and, you know, just being taken seriously. And NCIA is there fighting for the cannabis industry. We're working on the banking issue. We're working on the tax issue. We're making sure that people in the cannabis industry are treated like every other small business in America. And so I'm increasing uh, the visibility. I'm lobbying for our issues. I'm working with advocates, other industry groups, other industry partners, other groups out there to just increase the visibility of this interest or this industry uh, and then finally get legalization. And you mentioned, you know, some of the changes. And for a lot of people listening to this who may not, you know, have the background on cannabis, you know, currently right now, there are 47 states that have laws that conflict with the federal government. Uh, about 35 of those have working medical marijuana programs. About 11 of those have programs with low THC, and about 15 of them uh, allow for adult use. So any adult over 21 could buy uh, cannabis legally. And so, you know, that has come into conflict with the federal government law. For over 50 years, the federal government has said this is illegal. Cannabis is a Schedule I drug which means it has a high potential for abuse. It's currently no currently accepted medical treatment. It lacks accepted safety use under medical supervision. It is, it is a Schedule I drug, but cocaine and meth are Schedule II drugs. So our federal government, believe it or not, thinks that cannabis uh, is more dangerous than cocaine or meth. And just trying to rectify that, trying to mitigate that, trying to get policy officials at the federal level to come in line with where America is, where the public is, where the voters are. And, you know, when I started in 2013, the debate was sort of, should we be doing this? Now, 2021, we already know we should be doing this. It's how we roll out regulations. And so I'm looking, I'm looking forward to a discussion with you and Dave. It's going to be fun. Love it, Michael. Great perspective, bringing common sense back to Congress, especially from a cannabis perspective. We're going to have a lot of alliteration there on that one. Um, okay, now let's go to you, David. Let's break down a little bit um, from a company perspective and a corporate perspective. And for those listening in these seats who probably represent some of the most innovative companies 
in the world. Um, what do you think the regulatory landscape will be? And will there be reform this year? If so, do we know what type of reform? What's going to come next from a regulatory standpoint in cannabis this year? Uh, I think that it's uh, it's plausible that we see some sort of broad federal uh, legalization pass uh, sometime in the next two years. Uh, I think that it's mm. Uh, there are a variety of ways uh, that it can go where we have scenarios that, out, that outline some of the very different regulatory structures that might come into effect with federal legalization. Um, for example, right now, uh, every state that has a legal medical or adult use cannabis market is essentially siloed. They have constructed the entire supply chain for cannabis from uh, cultivation to processing to manufacturing to retail all within each individual state and cannabis is not legally uh, allowed to move across state lines. That's created some really interesting market dynamics and some really interesting opportunities for businesses. Uh, one of the possibilities that comes along with federal legalization is uh, the possibility of interstate commerce, the possibility for cannabis to start moving legally from one state to another. Uh, and if that happens, uh, it's unclear what happens to a lot of this sort of siloed infrastructure that has existed by virtue of the fact that it has had these artificial walls built up around it. Uh, for example, if you're growing uh, cannabis indoors in Maine, uh, and all of a sudden it becomes possible to import cannabis from places like California or Oregon or Washington, it's unclear whether it will remain economically viable to continue to grow cannabis in Maine. Um, similarly, uh, a lot of ancillary cannabis businesses, so businesses that are providing services to products or services to cannabis businesses, uh, have had this space to operate by virtue of the fact that a lot of big mainstream uh, companies are either unwilling or unable to do business with the cannabis industry. Uh, so if you are a cannabis payment processor that has come up with a cashless payment solution because it's so hard for cannabis businesses to get banking and merchant services, there's a need for that right now. And, and some of these companies are doing really well. Uh, when cannabis becomes federally legal uh, and all of a sudden Transaction and transactions in cannabis look like transactions in any other market, those companies will really have to figure out how to justify their existence. So one of the things that we're really heavily focusing on this year is working with companies, both um, plant touching uh, companies in the cannabis space, as well as ancillary businesses to understand where the opportunities and risks lie uh, with federal legalization. Uh, I, I don't think that I can overstate the uh, the tremendous change in, in landscape that's going to occur with federal legalization, no matter what it ends up looking like. And a lot of companies will fail uh, when that change happens. Um, some companies will be acquired, um, some of them, I'm sure, for really massive valuations. And some companies will be able to continue to thrive and grow. So we've seen this happen in states that have had major regulatory shifts. California, uh, with its adult use legalization and new medical rules, really dramatically changed the regulatory landscape in the state. And there was a mass die-off of businesses that were operating um, perfectly well under the previous loose medical regulations. But... Uh, were unable or unwilling to adapt to the new regulatory environment. This is on an entirely different scale. Um, if you look at something like Blockbuster, uh, Blockbuster Video operated profitably for years. It was a great business, but the internet changed that. And Netflix came along and introduced something fundamentally new into the landscape. That's what federal legalization does to the cannabis industry. It changes the landscape so much that some businesses, their their model just won't continue to be uh, sustainable or even solvent. 
Brilliant, David. I totally agree. It'll be fascinating to watch what happens and we'll be following along with ArcView, no doubt about it. Okay, so Michael, let's switch over to you. Now, there's a little bird that told me that you have had uh, some interesting conversations and maybe even a phone call with those on Capitol Hill that might give us some unique insider first time you heard it only at South by Southwest with ArcView situation. Can you, can you break that down for me? So, um... And by the time people listen to it, this will probably be in mid-March. But in mid-February, uh, Chuck Schumer, Cory Booker, and or Senator Chuck Schumer, Senator Cory Booker, and Senator Ron Wyden all uh, made some uh, announcement that they were looking at working together to do comprehensive reform. And they had done a phone call with a lot of uh, social justice advocates, criminal justice reform advocates, and uh, some industry uh, association people, we were on that phone call. And we were able to hear, you know, the priority of how we had the leader of the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer, saying this was a priority, and it was something that they uh, wanted to do when the votes were there. Now, I, I want to caution people. You know, for many years when uh, I was doing lobbying. The Republicans controlled the legislature. Everything we did, no matter how successful we were, it was just no, 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 nothing's going to happen. The Democrats took over the House in 2018, and you saw a difference. You started seeing bills moving. You started seeing positive hearings. You started seeing legislative markups. You started seeing the House voting on bills. And in uh, December last year, the House passed a uh, legalization, a descheduled bill, the MORE Act. Um, why do I bring this up? Because just having the Senate switch to Democrat means the discussion will change, the narrative will change, the committees, the committee chairs change. Now you have Democratic committee chairs that can move legislation, hold hearings on the bill, and now you have the majority leader saying that they're interested, this is important, and they want to do this sooner rather than later. But I do want to caution people that for anything like this to happen, you will need 60 senators signing off on something in a green. And that's where a lot of the work is going to uh, be on. It is not just not just 50 senators, not just 51 senators. You're going to need 60 senators to move something like this. And that means that we're going to have to be bipartisan. That means we're going to have to get some Republicans. One, um, I'm, I'm smart enough to know I never uh, make guarantees of what I, I look over my shoulder yeah. because Congress is behind me, what Congress is going to do. But I'm more optimistic now than I have been because now Democrats have uh, the legislature, the White House, uh, Kamala Harris is vice president, who was the co-sponsor of a descheduled bill, uh, is from California, um, that a leader on this issue, understands the importance of this issue. And the majority leader saying, yes, we want to do this. Now, uh, we still got a, a lot of work to do. There's going to be a lot of lobbying, a lot of coalition building. But as I mentioned before, cannabis is the most popular issue when it comes to voters out there. Uh, this is a win-win. You are starting to, at one time, this was just a blue state, West Coast issue, Democratic states. Now you are seeing Oklahoma, Mississippi, South Dakota, Montana, other states that are traditionally red states uh, turning uh, pro-cannabis. And so that makes it a lot easier to build a case in D.C. So I'm fairly optimistic, but um, we they know they have a window of about 18 months because who knows what's going to happen with the 2022 election. Interesting. So we got to watch the next six, uh, 16 to 18 months pretty carefully, it sounds like. And we need 60 senators to make it happen. Now, let's get tactical here, Michael. What do you think the likelihood is? If you were a betting man, what sort of odds would you give me? So um, uh, eight, I started this job eight years ago, and I thought this would be an eight to 10 year process. And for many years, I was telling people by the end of 2021, 2022, we could get something done depending on the election. Mm -hmm. Now we have the elections we want. I'm still shooting for that. You know, we have to get something done by this August or next August. We have to get the momentum. So yes, I'm, I'm not going to give up and we are going to put pressure on Democratic senators and Republican senators to come around and build a really good case. 
Exactly. Thanks for sharing that and all the important work you're doing. Uh, we certainly appreciate it in the industry and no doubt with the billions of dollars in sales we see every single year here, the economic impact is felt and real and there's lots of fun movement to be had in the cannabis industry. Okay, um, Michael. Let's talk rescheduling, descheduling, decriminalizing. We got a lot of words here about all the things we could do from a regulatory standpoint with cannabis. What do you think is most likely to happen and how will this actually go down? So one, just, uh, just a background for people. Uh, decriminalizing basically means you're not gonna get arrested for having small amounts of cannabis on you. Many states are going in that direction. Many jurisdictions are going in that direction. I live in DC uh, where uh, it is decriminalized and you saw arrests drop by over 90%. Then there is descheduling cannabis, which is taking it as that schedule one drug and keeping it like any other commodity, whether it's alcohol or nicotine, um, and regulating at the state level, developing it, its own federal regulations. And then there's rescheduling. And, and David, I would love to hear David's thoughts on this, but you know, there are schedule one, schedule two, schedule three drugs. If they move this to a different schedule, then you're looking at cannabis being more of a pharmaceutical model, something you get at a pharmacy versus, versus the free the plant, uh, have it used as an intoxicant. But I would love to hear David's you know, thoughts on this. Sure, yeah, I think uh, decriminalization is definitely better than nothing. I don't think that it goes far enough in terms of creating uh, a safe and equitable industry. Um, it's a, a great first step when there's not political will to, to legalize. Um, the Controlled Substances Act set up these five drug schedules and almost all drugs sit in one of those five schedules. Uh, alcohol and, and tobacco being notable exceptions. Moving it out of the drug scheduling um, system altogether, descheduling cannabis would allow the much of the infrastructure that has been built uh, at the state level to continue to, to operate. It would allow many of the companies that exist now to continue to participate in the industry. Um, if cannabis gets rescheduled, um, I think that that's bad for a variety of reasons. First of all, uh, then we're not talking about uh, an adult use substance. We're not talking about something that um, any, any adult can go out and buy. We're talking about something that um, is the, the province of pharmaceutical companies and is likely to require uh, a prescription. Uh, and the entire supply chain uh, that has been built in all of these states to produce, process, distribute, uh, manufacture, sell cannabis, almost none of that will be applicable to, a, say, a Schedule II or Schedule Three drug, uh, which means basically starting over from scratch and giving the entire industry to, uh, to the pharmaceutical industry. I don't think that that's a, a, a positive outcome. I don't think that that's a very likely outcome um, at this point, I think descheduling is um, is much more popular uh, among a, a much broader set of uh, constituents. Uh, but yeah, rescheduling is is kind of the the legalization nightmare scenario. And and just on David's point, NCIA is lobbying to deschedule cannabis. You know, there is I cannot think of an organization out there advocates or industry that wants to reschedule. Everyone is talking deschedule, and David mentioned the popularity. Um, if you saw politicians talk about rescheduling, they would probably be ex-politicians or they would get a lot of pressure uh, from voters because that's not the direction voters want. They want this descheduled. They want it you know, regulated on some level. This is not going to be like tomatoes. Uh, where it's just a commodity, you have to have some regulation. But I do not, I do not um, see this, you know, just being rescheduled and treated as a pharmaceutical uh, drug. Perfect. I think that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, to close us out here, let's narrow down slightly. What do we think is going to happen in the next 12 to 18 months? Let's do a rapid fire response. The more tweetable, the better, so that those listening can say they heard it here first. Uh, I'll just jump in and say um, the last thing we want is to have legalization and say, now what? 
the goal of legalization is to take the illicit market, make the illicit market become smaller, smaller, and smaller, and eventually disappear. And as you've seen in Washington State and California and other states, if they don't do regulations right, you will see the illicit market not go away. We need to create an environment where entrepreneurs uh, want to bring products and want to be part of this industry and the illicit market goes away. You have to do it right. And for anyone that's interested in doing it, uh, discussions are being uh, had now. Policymakers are making decisions and you need your voice heard or regulations are going to be developed that you may disagree with. Now is the time to really be active and let federal officials uh, uh, know what you're thinking. Yeah, I'm actually going to cheat and, and leave you with two thoughts. Um, the first is that uh, cannabis companies, again, plant touching or ancillary cannabis companies really need to be thinking about how they're positioning themselves with respect to the most likely uh, federal legalization scenarios. Uh, the ones that do it right are going to make unbelievable amounts of money, and the ones that do it wrong are going to fail. Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're helping folks understand that. We're tracking uh, everything that's going on at the federal level. We're tracking everything that goes on at the state level. We're working with, uh, with advocacy and trade organizations like NCIA um, to, to really make sure that our scenarios are the most likely uh, scenarios and uh, that we can provide these, these businesses with guidance to help them position themselves uh, well. Um, the second thing that, that I'll leave you with is something that we didn't really uh, discuss much, but it's social equity. Um, cannabis has been illegal for decades, and uh, uh, black and brown communities have borne the brunt of that illegality. Um, it has disproportionately affected those communities in ways that have torn many of those communities apart. We now are entering a phase where many states have legalized it and the federal government is likely to legalize soon. Uh, people are starting to make real money in this industry. Uh, and we cannot have a situation where the communities that were systematically uh, destroyed uh, through the prohibition of cannabis don't have an opportunity uh, to sit at the legal table. Uh, so we're seeing lots of states and local jurisdictions um, <laughs> create equity provisions to make sure that um, that folks from uh, the, the communities most impacted by the war on drugs are able to uh, get into the cannabis industry and thrive in the cannabis industry. And that's going to be uh, an important uh, an important thing to look at uh, at the federal level as well. And not just sort of access to licenses, but also access to funding, access to education, um, all of the things that uh, that folks need to uh, to thrive in the cannabis space. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, as most people listening here probably realize, the cannabis industry is no longer for the few. This is an industry on the verge of breaking out and maybe already mid-breakout. And so if you are like 61% of the rest of the population out here listening today and thinking that this industry should be legalized and thinking that this industry should have its tentacles reach into other sectors, then this is the time for you to get involved and to engage more on the subject matter. You have a couple of great experts to go to, and we're only going to hear from more of them. Oh, South by Southwest. I'm excited for this one. I know we can't pick favorites because they're all our favorite children, but I got a thing for CPG, Consumer Packaged Goods. And we've invested in a ton of these companies over the year, and I have personally as well. And um, what's fascinating to me is that you're going to hear from some of the largest and, and biggest CEOs in the cannabis consumer packaged goods space. These are individuals who not only pioneered the industry in a lot of ways as first movers, but also pioneered with massive innovation. You have people here who have megastars on their cap tables. Actually, we got a few of you from, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow to Jay-Z um, to Tovlo. We have some of the biggest names in Celebrityville on these uh, individuals' cap tables. We also have people who have done, you know, multi-billion dollar SPACs. 
and we have people who have created products that have revolutionized packaging from a sustainable perspective um, and also crossed the lines between CBD and THC. So I'm excited about this, cap uh, this uh, panel today, and I'm excited about the fact that we get to see live, and you'll get to hear it live, the evolution of this industry from the stereotypical industry replete with tie-dyes and green leaves all over the packaging to what are some of the most innovative, streamlined, and beautifully designed packaging, I, I think you see in, in any space that would rival what's on the shelves of Whole Foods uh, or Erewhon. And so what I want to do is a little bit different this time. I want you guys to give me your bios, short and sweet. I know that'll be hard with all your accomplishments across each of you. Uh, and then we'll break down further into your individual companies and throw some questions at you. So with that, why don't we go ahead and start with Luke Anderson, who runs a company called CAN, C-A-N-N, -N, which is a micro Dose beverage company uh, because we did invest in him at EEC, so we'll give we'll give you a totally unfair deference, Luke. And why don't you kick it off for us, buddy? Thanks, Cody. Uh, my name is Luke Anderson. I'm one of the co-founders of Can. It is a microdose THC beverage, and um, we're proud to be the number one microdose THC beverage in California. Uh, hope grand plans to expand all over the country and. Uh, one day be available on the shelf in Whole Foods where you see some of those beautiful CPG products that cannabis is trying to catch up to. But uh, of course, we'll take a little bit of regulatory reform to get there. Uh, our drinks are two milligrams THC and four milligrams of CBD for uh, an individual can. And we're trying to model the same sessionable social drinking behavior that you see with the alcohol industry and get people away from the dollar per milligram trends um, uh, that you see in cannabis today. Perfect. And Luke, you're no slouch. You and your co-founder are former Bain consultants and capital guys uh, who came into the industry because you saw an opportunity here to present itself. That's correct. Um, yeah, management consultants, um, business school. Uh, Jake, my uh, co-founder and, and the original mastermind behind Can, actually grew up in Colorado, witnessed legalization and believed that beverage was the next frontier. Perfect. Thanks, Luke. Let's kick it over to you, Dennis. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dennis for many years and seeing the myriad of companies that have spilled out of his mind and into the universe. So why don't you talk to us about your holding company and the underlying companies that you've created and, and sort of revolutionized many aspects of cannabis? Sure, sure. Uh, Pleased to meet everybody. Uh, Dennis O'Malley, the COO of The Parent Company. Uh, it, the, the website is the, the parent.co, and, and that, that came to being uh, through a SPAC, a transaction that closed in January 15th of this year, bringing together assets um, from Kaliva and Left Coast Ventures um, from the SPAC sponsor, Subversive Capital. And, and, and so moving forward, as, as Cody mentioned, we have a myriad of brands, but we, we really are a CPG company that has a house of brands and been very focused on the direct consumer channel and have really been built our business on vertical integration. So today we're very focused in California. Um, many of our brands um, that you see behind me, whether it's a Caliva or Monogram are in the inhalable space around flower, vape and pre-rolls. Uh, but with the combination of Left Coast Ventures, we go all the way from, from lotions, uh, gel ca caps, uh, vapes, et cetera. Um, so uh, we're also well known for our chief visionary officer uh, Mr. Uh, Sean Carter, also known as, uh, as Jay-Z, and we're, we're very proud, uh, you know, with his leadership to uh, have created a social equity fund that we funded for uh, $10 million initially. We've also taken the uh, Robert Smith Challenge, so 2% of net income will go ahead and, and fund that social equity fund on an, on an annual basis. So it was very important to all of us in terms of, uh, as mentioned previously, in terms of federal legalization. Um, to, to ensure that we are, are going about this the, the right way. And we're lo looking forward to that program as well. Perfect. Thanks, Dennis. I actually happen to love your Kaliva pain creams. So I gave, gave some to my grandmother. Um, so now let's go on to Adam. And Adam, you know, hate to say we're saving the best for last, but there's certainly some incredible things that you've accomplished at Papa and Barkley. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about your company and the many products that you have, some of which I've also tried and find fascinating as well. So Adam, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Cody. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, Adam Grossman, I'm the founder and executive chairman of Puppa and Barkley. Uh, we're a California-based company that focuses on wellness products, uh, including topicals like our almond transdermal patches and consumables, uh, including tinctures and capsules, and more recently gummies. 
uh, our products are primarily targeted for medicinal users for pain and sleep and anxiety. We also have a line of CBD products that are sold nationally uh, online in, in places like Vitamin Shop, Natural Grocers, and Erewhon. So we're in both markets, the regulated California market uh, and then in the national market. So we are seeking to evolve uh, to become a true CPG and uh, all of our products are, are made using artisanal methods, often by hand, uh, to, you know, without chemicals or solvents and preserving sort of the full spectrum of cannabinoids and terpenes and phytonutrients that are found in the plant. Um, so I'm excited to be here and talk to you all today. Super interesting. Thanks for sharing, Adam. You know, I, I do recall that your product was one of the first ones that I thought there was real intentionality behind the design of the packaging from your, you know, sort of wood lids to the modernistic font to the, your focus on relief and the medicinal aspects of the plant, you know, to your origin story with, with your father. Um, so thank you for sharing that. You created an incredible company. Let's actually move to Luke now. And Luke, you know, you decided to come into this industry from the Big Bad Bang and move into cannabis. I'm sure that was never something any of us thought we would grow up and do is become, become uh, cannabis CPG experts. And so, you know, give Given that you focused on CPG at Bain, what, you know, have you seen sort of modernize in the cannabis industry today and how has it changed from historical to where we are now? Yeah, I, I think it's still very early innings, um, probably inning one of nine, 11% um, of the way there. Uh, I, when I was at Bain & Company, we looked at the evolution of categories within CPG and industries, uh, you know, it starts the power is upstream with the growers and then there's the processors and the distributors and the retailers and then the brands at the end of the day hold the power and the consumer loyalty. Um, I, I think that we are still so early on that right now the distributors have the power, the retailers sometimes fight with the distributors and there isn't really any brand loyalty because there's so many substitutes. You know, if you don't have your favorite brands gummy, you're generally, you don't have as long of an experience with that brand and you will be okay buying another brand of gummy. Um, I think there are, you know, parallels in other CPG spaces. Um, you know, alcohol is one of my favorite ones to compare this to. Uh, there's beer and wine licenses and there are liquor licenses. There are places where you can consume lower potency, safer alcoholic beverages. And there are places where you can, you know, buy Everclear, no problem. We in cannabis don't even have that yet. Um, microdose products are regulated in exactly the same way as 1,000 milligram tinctures. And, and I think that there needs to be a, a series of changes uh, and that will come with a greater depth and understanding of the safety of different types of cannabis products. Um, and over time, I think uh, you will see legitimacy in certain categories where there isn't any right now. I think we all remember when kombucha didn't make sense or GTs was the only brand out there doing kombucha. Today, that is absolutely not the case. Oat milk, same thing with Oatly. And now I think there are probably dozens of oat milk brands and it's, it's very, very easy to find anywhere. Um, there needs to be enough variety within each individual subcategory of cannabis in order for it to really spread its wings as an industry. And, and there's very little choice in certain categories, you know, like mine beverage. Uh, so we got a long way to go. Perfect. Thanks for sharing that, Luke. You know, it's fascinating. You've always been a really big advocate for competitors, actually, in the industry to uplift the category overall and for consumers, the importance of having multiple different products on shelves. Um, so I appreciate that. Now, Dennis, let's go to you because talk about being in an industry when there weren't very many uh, competitors to today. You have been in this industry of cannabis for a long time. So I imagine your lens is going to be slightly different than Luke's into how you see the world and how people will utilize cannabis going forward. You want to break that down for us? Yeah, I, I think, you know, like Luke, it, in terms of building the brand, we really do look at um, brand building and the, the, the challenges abound in the cannabis industry. And, and, and if you take a look at just some of the, you know, foundational elements that you have or the restrictions that you have in terms of building that brand, um, it, it, start, it really starts from the, the, the products and, and where your supply is. And, and we knew that going into it, you know, from uh, Kaliva before the parent company had been around since 2015, but it, it you know, made a significant investment in terms of vertical integration because you really needed to 
control your cost, your, your quality, your service levels, your really your brand promise to the consumer. Very hard to do that if you outsource that in cannabis. Uh, the second part of that is, is that you, know, you can create a great brand, but if you put it in the hands of a, of a dispensary and that, you know, that bud tender doesn't do its justice in, in terms of being able to position it, uh, that just doesn't work either. So, so at least we took a path that said, not only are we going to own our supply chain, but we have to own that consumer experience because we really thought that that touch point with the consumer was, was absolutely critical in building a brand. And it, it takes a lot of investment to go do that, but we've, we've been laser focused on, on continuing to build you know, what we think is, is going to be the most impactful cannabis company around to, to go do that. But, but if you look at the, some of the challenges of building the brand, we can't use Facebook. You can't spend a dime on Instagram. You can't you know, spend any money on Google. So you have to come up with innovative ways to be actually get your brand notion out there. And oh, by the way, if you're trying to leverage, uh, you know, true brand awareness, it's very difficult to do so in a very confined place. For us, it's having to geo-target in California. And it's not just geo-target in California, but it's actually trying to show a consumer, where do you actually go buy that product? Uh, so those are significant challenges, uh, you know, around. So I really do think, uh, to Luke's point, in terms of innings, this is like the internet of, you know, 1999 and 2000, where Back then, if you tried to build your own website, you had to do so on a custom basis, and it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not a million dollars, for a consumer site. And, and it just the infrastructure and the ecosystem wasn't there. But as it, uh, people talked about on the last panel, when this does get to federal permissibility, you're going to see uh, customers resonate with brands. And we really do think that there's going to be a massive power of brands not just in you know California, but all, all across the, the United States. And, and we're doubling down on, on what do we do to me, maintain that brand promise for consumers, both from that supply, but also from that co consumer experience. Yeah, advertising is not easy in this industry. That is for sure, which maybe is why somebody here got Jay-Z to be uh, as a part of their company and a chief visionary officer to sort of spread the word, right, Dennis? Um, that was an exciting development for the industry overall. Okay, let's switch to you, Adam, um, for a couple different reasons. You've also been in the industry a long time. You've really sort of saddled between CBD and also THC, understanding both sides of the industry with its nuances, and have seen the difficulties firsthand in growing and building and creating a company in cannabis. Why don't you talk to us about some of those so that people can understand this industry in a little bit more detail from the entrepreneur's perspective. I definitely agree with, with Luke and, and Dennis in terms of the difficulty and, and where we're at in the evolution of, of cannabis. And as I mentioned, we're in both of those worlds in terms of the regulated market in California and then in the national market. And the differences are profound in those two worlds in terms of competitors and distribution channels, of course, regulatory and compliance and, and manufacturing, uh, even culture. Uh, but by way of example, in the, in the California market, as opposed to the typical CB, CPG brand where you can re rely on contract manufacturers and there's distributors and, and merchant processors, uh, we, as early movers in California, we had to build our own factories. We created a distribution company to, to deliver our products. Uh, you can't use, of course, UPS or, or FedEx. Everything had to be built from the ground up. Uh, and, you know, as opposed to just relying in the CPG world on a contract manufacturer to bring your product to life and then establish distribution channels. So when we moved into the CPG realm, into the national market, uh, we started to have to compete against uh, players like Nature's Way and these Irwin Naturals, large uh, nutraceutical companies uh, that have been in business for 30 years and, and have huge departments. So uh, the two worlds, I think, are evolving towards each other rapidly, but it, it's really early days. And for us, the process of competing in the national market, I think, has been really helpful in terms of having to raise our game on things like uh, understanding the, the GMP manufacturing that we need to rely on in the, in the national market. In California, we can we, that we're not required to be GMP certified, uh, although we're on track to be there by the end of the year. Uh, so it's an interesting process in terms of how you uh, bring up the standards in terms of things like 
on uh, packaging claims and, and et cetera. So uh, there's definitely a long way to go in my mind between uh, where cannabis companies are and, and where they need to be. No doubt about it. It is a tough industry. I even think about it from a packaging perspective. You know, if I had a dime for every time the state regulators across all the legalized states mandated that the packaging would change and what that does to the supply chain, um, and that's just one aspect of it. So I always sort of chuckled when people talked about a green rush and how easy it is to make money in cannabis. Not quite the case. I mean, you all have proven that it's absolutely possible, but the industry is relatively complex and definitely overregulated. Um, so let's let's actually talk about some other industries that might have some similar parallels. For instance, many people compare the alcohol and tobacco industries to cannabis. People like to think of them all as these vices. Now, I have my own opinions on this, but what about, you know, from your perspectives, is cannabis like the alcohol and tobacco industries, or are there other industries that it has more parallels with? And for this one, let's switch it up, keep you on your virtual toes. And Dennis, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, I'd say I often hear that comparison for you know all the obvious reasons of alcohol and tobacco. I, I just tend to go back and say, last time I checked, you know, you, you drink alcohol, and last time I checked, you you, you smoke tobacco or you put it in your your lip in, in some areas of the country. But uh, you know, in cannabis, it, it's just the, the, this amazing amount of different form factors that you have, uh, and it's it's hard. It, it, it's you have uh, THC, CBD, hemp. You have one milligram, five milligrams. You you have uh, you know onset, offset. Uh, there's just so many different things that a consumer is just, just trying to say. I, I'd like to not feel pain. I'd like to go to sleep. I'd like to have less anxiety. What is all of these gel caps, vapes, flowers? Uh, you know, drinks. What do I do here? So. It's a very complicated consumer journey, and it's a considered purchase. You know, in a liquor store, I don't think their average transaction is $100, and I don't think that's that's the case for, I have no idea what cigarettes cost these days, but I don't think it's it's $100 either. But when, when it, you know, the consumer is coming, especially for a delivery, our, our average order value is $100. And so it's a very considered purchase. It's very personal. It almost always has a designated uh, purpose. Uh, and what we find, again, is that pain, sleep, and anxiety in that order. So I actually think that there's a lot more parallels to what Adam said is in the, the either nutraceutical or the OTC type of markets. Um, but we really do find when we do get a product fit with a consumer and they find that it works, like, as you said, Cody, with the Cleveland lotions, they tend to tell everybody about it. Right. And, and it's the ultimate word of mouth marketing. It's, it's like, oh, my God, I got through this maze of products and I actually found out where and how to buy it. And I actually talked to a trusted expert and I used the product and it was great. Um, but every step of that journey is hard. And, and, and to give you a sense of it, um, you know, 68 percent of our cons uh, of our consumer transactions happen online. And 25 percent of those transactions are assisted by a chat. Because it's COVID, uh, you know, you don't go up and spend 12 to 15 minutes talking to a wellness consultant about what works for you. So that consumer behavior is translated to online. So people have a ton of questions. And I just don't see that in the alcohol and tobacco space. So again, I, I would go back to a nutraceutical uh, or OTC where somebody has a lot of questions about what to take for their uh, desired state. Love it. Okay, Adam, so what do you think? Do you totally disagree with Dennis? Is he completely off base? What's your perspective here? Uh, no, I've been nodding because, as usual, I'm, I'm completely aligned with Dennis's perspective. Uh, full disclosure: we, we we do business together, but yeah, I, I agree. I would I would place our industry much closer to, uh, and it firmly resides in the CBD line uh, of our business, at least in in the nutraceutical realm. Um, and I think that the difference between sort of the OTC uh, product mixes and the higher regulated FDA uh, governance of, uh, you know, that, that that's the closer analog from an industry perspective. And I also agree with the, the massive differential around education that's required in our business. I, I can't tell you the, uh, the hours that we also spend uh, consulting with, with clients and building out content to explain the differences uh, 
be, not not necessarily even just between sort of the ratios of cannabinoids, but the the variability from the way that you ingest the difference between, for instance, uh, digesting a capsule uh, through your digestive system versus a tincture that you're putting under your under your tongue and the individual variability. So. Um, yeah, I guess from a regulatory standpoint, I, I see it being much more likely to be oversaw in a, in a scheme that, that mirrors the, uh, the market for nutraceuticals. All right. Well, let's wrap it up with you, Luke. What do you think, especially maybe from a beverage perspective in cannabis? Yeah, it's so funny. Uh, you know, when I first came into the cannabis industry, I sat in at a BevNet panel and uh, one of the leading cannabis beverage and THC beverages at the time um, was represented up there. And, and and he said, hey, you know, cannabis beverages, particularly THC beverages, are used for sleep, pain, and anxiety, and anybody who tells you different is lying to you. And I was sitting there, and I was like, you know, I believe that for cannabis products, CBD products, even though kind of in very different ways, yes. But here we are. We are the fastest growing, highest volume, uh, you know, in terms of number of cans produced, um, uh, you know, cannabis beverage brand in the country. And it, nobody is using it for those purposes. People are using it for alcohol substitution. So back to you know how we look at the original question, we're still in such early innings that the industry, THC, CBD, you know, different form factors of cannabis are all kind of clumped together. You know, I'm experiencing day to day something that's totally different. People buy cans and drink cans as a, you know, a non-alcoholic social drink. It's to have a little bit of fun and avoid a hangover and still feel included in the predominant social, you know, uh, mild intoxicant, which is booze. And, and, and I think what's interesting about this from a broader industry perspective is, you know, that's, that's the land grab opportunity is there's, you know, 80% of American adults, 21 out of 25 on a beverage daily survey a couple of years ago said, I am trying to drink less alcohol. I want to drink less alcohol, but I don't really know how. Um, the number of people that are looking for cannabis for sleep, pain, and anxiety, I, I think it's it's less than, than 80%. Um, and so I think the more we can think about nuances and treat different product categories differently and look at analogs um, that way, the better. Like the answer for Papa and Barkley, you know, and for, for TPC is, you know, probably, yeah, nutraceutical is more like it, but for me, it's totally different. And so- um, you know, that's, that's my take. That's exactly right. I think it's critical that people realize that cannabis consumers are not homogenous. It goes from my 93 year old grandmother to, you know, somebody who uses them for arthritic pain cream to somebody who uses them recreationally to somebody who is a can consumer, maybe replacing Chardonnay with a small microdosed beverage. So the industry is very broad across that spectrum. And that's why I think it's so important to be parts of panels like this and to go and follow along at a group like ArcView and at each of these companies' websites so that you have a pulse on the industry that in my opinion will be one of the largest wealth generation creators of our time. So in that vein, I'd like to go specifically to you, Dennis, first, for people to tell you where can they go to get more involved with TPC? Where can they go if they want to hear more about you guys or for partnerships? Where do they go and what should they know? Sure. So again, the, the, the website for the parent company is theparent.co. And, and we're looking for really innovative partners out there who are, who are interested in, in, in really good collabs that are that are really on the the, uh, the emerging and innovative side of things with just tra traditional type of uh, traditional type of activations. We we love that you know N Nike got into collabs with uh, with having cannabis shoes, and we we love that you know there's been content creators out there who have built content around uh, around cannabis as well. So we'd love those uh, to have those types of discussions. And and then lastly is is certainly we're we're always on the lookout for. Uh, great social equity uh, companies to invest in with our with our ten million dollar fund as well. So, um, looking forward to to having those conversations. Great. Okay, Adam, let's go to you now. Tell us what are you looking for? What kind of partnerships do you want? What sort of people do you want to draw into the Papa and Barkley circle? And where should they go for partnerships with Papa and Barkley? Uh, well, when we think about partnerships, and this is a great community to reach out to, it, it's mainly around channel partnerships for distribution. 
Uh, so partners that align with our values around plant medicine and natural healing and that have built communities of, of like-minded folks. Um, for, by way of example, we, we are working with a, an oncology group called Cornerstone Wellness that runs clinics around the country for uh, cancer patients. And they also provide ancillary products and services to help them through their treatment um, and, you know, that meet the standards. So uh, that's a good example of, of a channel partnership that we really value. Uh, also on the education side of things, as we talked about earlier, it's such a complicated industry to understand. So some of the partnerships that we have on the education side um, are with platforms, one uh, in California that educates seniors around cannabis um, and another that provides doctors consultations for folks that really wanna delve into the medicinal side of cannabis. So uh, we'd love to partner with other channel partners that, that kind of focus on, on these types of communities and on health and wellness and uh, that you know, we could reach out to, to, to partner with. Okay, Michael, let's go to you on a regulatory standpoint. And from NCIA's perspective, who should reach out to partner with you and why should they? Where do they go? Uh, well, one, we are a trade association. For, so from an audience standpoint, if people are trying to get involved with the cannabis industry, uh, feel free to join NCIA. Uh, go to our website, check our membership. But from a political standpoint, we will partner with anyone at the political level to uh, achieve our goals, to have more partners, to build a great uh, coalition. And, I, you know, the last bit of advice for people is, um, cannabis legalization is not going to happen because people are sitting on the sidelines. You know, get active, uh, donate, donate to advocacy groups, donate to industry groups that are be part of it. Uh, let policymakers hear your voice, uh, so we can all be proud of the cannabis industry uh, uh, that we want. So, just appreciate the time. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, RQ and uh, South by Southwest. Really appreciate it. Follow me on social media at thepotlobbyist.com. Nice little plug there, Michael. Okay, Luke, tell me about you. Where should people go to check you guys out and maybe follow at Instagram? I know I have a blast doing that. Uh, if you're interested in the future of drinking, go to drinkcan.com. That's D-R-I-N-K-C-A-N-N, -N, two N's. Um, or follow us on Instagram at drinkcan. And if you're looking to partner with a, a new social drinking option or you're looking to make a, a private event or any type of experience more inclusive to people that are looking to steer away from alcohol but don't want to sacrifice on the social lubricant or mild controllable buzz, um, then, then DM us, uh, reach out uh, on our website, and uh, we will definitely make sure that it is an experience to remember. David, since you guys are the hosts here today, why don't you close it out for us? Where should people go to engage more with the ArcView group? Sure. Yeah. So uh, at ArcView, we're looking for a, a pretty broad variety of partners. Uh, ArcView is the first and oldest uh, cannabis investment uh, market research and advisory ecosystem. Uh, so we've got a, a venture fund and a FINRA licensed broker dealer and uh, a market research division and uh, our advisory um services and consulting group, as well as uh, just general content and, and education. So if you're looking to raise capital in the cannabis space, if you're looking to deploy capital in the cannabis space, uh, if you're uh, a company looking to uh, wrap your head around the very nascent and uh, complex hemp supply chain, uh, or if you're a cannabis business uh, trying to understand how to to grow sustainably and position yourselves to, to not only survive, but, but thrive uh, when federal legalization passes, uh, visit us at uh, arcviewgroup.com. Well, perfect. Thank you all for joining us here today at ArcView's South by Southwest presentation. We were thrilled to have you, and I hope you now believe, as we do, that the future looks pretty green. Thank you.